confidence for me. I spent 20 points. You spent okay. 20 Five exactly. Huh? What was your thought process? Take it through it. Well, I knew I was going to have to have two star players offensively, and then I needed pitching. Okay, hold your whiteboard up and ready to go. let us Let see. Explain it. This equals to 20 points. Explain Trey it Turner stuff. was a steal at four. Yeah. Okay, I think he's he's probably the, out there. Judge DeGrom. I thought about Verlander, but I went with DeGrom. Okay. Rodon was the reason I went over the top there. And then Evaldi. That's a great list. That's a pretty good list. That's pretty. Equals out to 20. I, I, I only spent 17 Why? points. <laughs> Stop being thrifty. I need I need a, he needs a CVS yeah, coupon. That's because I, I like Bassett, who was only three points, and I like Mitch Hanniger for he's a one pointer. Oh my gosh, hold the both my of team these up side by yours. side. It's so different. My team kills yours. You just went chalky star power. Well, well hey. Of, you can I'm, I'd rather spend than be frugal yeah. like you. Oh, uh, 17. I put those three points in my pocket. It just like half the league. What's yeah. not gonna... <laughs> uh, okay, Mark Feinstein, you want to get in on this fun? What do you got? What you got, Mark? I, I, man, this is hard. I went with, I think I spent 19 here. Judge oh, Turner, Rodon, Rodon. Bassett. Nemo, Bassett. We got four of the same guys. I thought about difference. going to Grom over Rodon, but I think if you're looking to build a team, I like the guy who's younger and may not uh, have as many injury questions. Yeah, but I was looking at just for this year. Me too. I was thinking more this year. Oh, yeah. you guys are Just this year, then I'm going to make a change here. I'm going to get rid of Rodon, and I'm going to put Verlander there. For really? Be... Woo! Maddie, what was oh. the most difficult decision for you? Uh, now I spent 20. Spending? Not, not taking Verlander was difficult for me. That was me too. Not taking Verlander or Kershaw. Like, I wanted both of those guys. I had both of them listed at first, too. And you are right. And, and I would even flop DeGrom for Verlander. But I feel all right with this. That's a pretty good list. Keith, um, who I'm, would be first off the change. board for you, Keith Costas? First off the board for me? Oh I think you need the surest thing, so I'd go with Judge, which we have a consensus on so far. Matt's making adjustments. Turner was number money. one off the board for me. You already saved money, honey. Okay, 19. I got 19 points now. So we saved one point. Because I put Verlander in for, uh, for Bassett. Oh, you spent some money. Yeah. <laughs> Pains me. <laughs> <laughs> Keith is the judge. He gets to hand select. Which the winning board did the best You're job. It, you look at that one there, Matt. I'll look at this camera here. Hold it there. I'll hold it here. Then they can split screen this stuff up. <laughs> hold yours up, Mark. <laughs> Harold producing is, like, again. is this a live request job. for a four-way? Is that how that works? <laughs> hold yours up, Mark. Ah, there we go. All right, Harold. I'm declaring you the winner. Of Thank this game. you. That'll wait, Keith. Keith. Who's second, Keith? Keith? Who's second? Uh, Mark, because he's closest to me, and I don't want to hear from Maddie. <laughs> What's your, what are you writing? Protest. Protest. That's because you save money, honey. If you were an actual general manager, you could dictate how the press conference yeah. goes. Game is you you can reimagine. What would you do? You can reimagine. Re if I could set my own press conference. Yeah, what would they say? Uh, full bar, first of all. <laughs> open bar. Full open bar, which would start five hours before the press conference. So guys like Feinstein would show up, liquored up, and ask some interesting questions for the first time in their lives. <laughs> that's what I would do. If you can guarantee I won't get fired. Now that's a press conference. <laughs> Woo! Here we go. Oopsie-daisy. Let's take a break. Uh, when we come back league with uh, some first person perspective on something that he has authored on MLB.com which I find very interesting. He has presented the 2023 all trade rumor team. Wow. Players that are going to have How would you come up with the that, title? That trade rumor whisper around them all year long. Let's go through this Mark. Welcome. Yeah so uh, we've done this I think this is our fifth annual one. We'll bring up the big board here and show you our entire team. Uh, this is not guys who are going to be traded, but this is guys who are going to be mentioned in trade rumors in between now and the deadline at the end of July. Uh, and you see a lot of these guys have some team control left, which to me, I think, makes them the most attractive uh, in terms of potential trade opportunities. Let's start with, obviously, the biggest name on this board. Down on the bottom right there, Shohei Otani. Uh, I, the Angels have said they're not going to trade him this offseason. They obviously have lived up to that, but that doesn't mean that his name is not going to be floated out there in the months ahead, if the Angels don't get off to a good start, or even if they get off to a good start like last year and then fade quickly like last year, uh, Otani, if the Angels don't think they're going to be able to re-sign him, it's hard to imagine that they're not going to trade him because even a half season of Shohei Otani, given everything he brings to the table, you're going to be able to bring back a haul of prospects or players for him. So uh, if the Angels aren't looking like a postseason contender 
by mid to late June, early July, uh, we're going to hear a lot about a Shohei Otani trade. Uh, another guy on my list there at second base was Glaber Torres. Again, two years of control left, so not a free agent to be. But the Yankees are in a position where they've got a couple of really big time young emerging outfield infield prospects rather anthony volpe oswald peraza throw oswaldo cabrera in that mix as well and you've also got dj lemayhew on the roster without a position to play right rizzo's at first uh you know shortstop right now they're expecting it to maybe be one of the kids or kind of falef is there as well but lemayhew doesn't play short third base you got josh donaldson so lemayhew could step into second base if the yankees decide they need to fill a hole elsewhere Two years of control for Glaber Torres appealing, and he hasn't quite ever gotten back to that all-star form from his first two seasons, uh, but I think there's still value there as well. Next on our list, we're going to go with another guy in New York, Eduardo Escobar. Uh, assuming that Carlos Correa ever officially becomes a Met, they all of a sudden have a little bit of a log jam in the infield. Escobar, very reasonably priced, $9.5 million this year, a $9 million option for 2024 uh, and again he'll be a man without a position the Mets already have Luis Guillorme on their roster to be a utility type um, so I think Escobar could be a good option for another team that's looking for some help in the infield he's versatile plays all over could be a starting third baseman somewhere uh, so I think if the Correa deal finishes up which I guess we expect it will at some point uh, Escobar becomes a, a piece that they can use elsewhere do you uh, like him or Guillorme better well, I like Escobar better, but he costs a lot more than Guillaume does, and not that the Mets are worried about payroll. Yeah. But, uh, you know, if you've got two guys who can do the job and one of them can bring you back uh, something to help you elsewhere in your team, I think that's something to consider. Yeah. Pablo Lopez is my pitch starting pitcher on this team. We heard him mention in trade rumors last summer. There was talk about a Pablo Lopez for Gleyber Torres trade at one point, so who knows if that gets rekindled. Uh, but Lopez has two years of control left, and the Marlins are so deep in their young pitching staff. Obviously, I think they would be open to trading any starting pitcher not named Sandy Alcantara, and Lopez probably has the most value uh, ERA under four the last three seasons, and uh, certainly, uh, you know, after throwing 180 innings last year, uh, showed that he can, you know, be a durable guy out there for them. So I think Lopez, uh, the Marlins are looking for an impact bat. He would seem to be the best path for them to acquire them. Yeah, I, they, his name got kicked around a lot last year, and there were a lot of us that thought he might have been dealt early in the hot stove season this year. He's still Marlins property. I want to add on Otani, too, that the fact that the Angels signed him to that one year, that record-setting arbitration deal, allowed them enough time with Otani to transition into potentially a new ownership group, which would give that new ownership group potentially an opportunity to open their own discussions with him uh, and perhaps keep him as an angel. Everybody's thinking it's just a, a done deal that he's going to be moved. I, I would caution that. I think that after an ownership change, you have no idea what direction a franchise True. is going to take. And maybe if they, I'm buying the angels, the first thing I do is lock up Otani. It's an interesting That's thing, my right? Value. Because of teams that sell, sometimes a team's for sale and they want to get all the furniture out of the house and get the lowest possible sale price. Yeah. Right? Uh, the Angels are going about it differently. They're adding to the payroll. They kept Otani. They want expensive furniture to come with the house. And that's why that deal is going to be yeah. as big as it's going to be, but I think. He, but, but Mark, it'd be, it would be amazing the haul that they would get back. I mean, that's your Herschel Walker trade back in the day, right? The yeah, Kansas except Herschel Walker was for his whole career, right? He was he was pretty young at the time. You look at Otani, you'd be trading for a guy for three months, yeah. two months, whatever. whenever it comes down, if it does. Uh, but I think we've seen other big players get traded and bring back a number of big-time prospects. You figure you're trading for two players, essentially, if you trade for Otani. So not to mention marketing. Yeah, but I'd, I'd have to, have to have a conversation. There was, a, there was another guy on your list I know that Harold wants to talk about here. We all thought that Brian Reynolds was going to be dealt earlier. We thought he was going to the Yankees. Everybody was connecting him to various trade suits. Yeah, where's my cousin going? What do you think? <laughs> well, just because you asked to be traded, I said this earlier, doesn't mean you get dealt correct but I do believe that the value as the winter has gone through the glaring hole in our sport used to be a strong suit is now a weakness I think and that's center field it's not the big position that it was with because you don't have that many guys that are 
patrolling that and dominating it. And I think that opens up the door for him quite a bit with a lot of clubs. It does. I think the fact that he demanded a trade puts the Pirates in an odd position because you wonder if teams are going to say, well, he wants out. They have to trade him. We're going to try to lowball him a little bit. The Pirates are looking for a huge package. I mean, some people have said that he they're looking for a package similar to what the Nationals got for Juan Soto last year. Let's let's slow ourselves down a little bit here. Brian Reynolds is a really nice player. He's not Juan Soto. So I'm not sure that that expectation is going to be met. He's also got three years of club control left. So the Pirates are in no rush to move him. And if they do move him because he asked for a trade, you're setting an awful precedent for players to just say, oh, well, that's how it works. Yeah. And I want a trade. And now all of a sudden you're the NBA where players can control where they go. So the Pirates are not going to be in a rush to do this. If a team meets their needs, then they would probably move him. But it would not surprise me at all if he's a Pirate through the year and this becomes a, a situation again for next offseason with two years of control left. Well, and the, the other thing that kind of affects us a little bit too, a lot of times when this type of a player where he's at gets traded, you know the contract. They've locked him in and then you deal him. Right here, with the market being the way it is, you don't know what you're going to end up paying him when he gets straight. Fair point. And you can you read uh, Mark's piece on MLB.com <laughs> presenting. And I want to thank you and your folks at MLB.com, Mark, for utilizing the colors of the Armenian flag here on Armenian Christmas. Uh, Merry Christmas. Christmas thank today. you very much for the blue, red, and apricot because uh, Merry Christmas to all my uh, fellow highs out there. Way to go. Uh, Mark, I love that concept. Good job, buddy. Let's, uh, let's go to Twitter as we go to break. And this from the Atlantic League's Staten Island Ferry Hawks. Do you want to see who the new Ferry Hawks manager is for the 2023 season? Tune into MLB Network at 10.30 a.m. Eastern time. That's in 20 minutes to get all the information you need on this historic Ferry Hawks signing. That's right. Thank you, Ferry Hawks social media team, for driving some eyeballs to us. I guess we can't reveal who that is oh, yet. Well, we're going to talk 10 to him. 10.30. 10.30. We're going to talk to him. Any idea who it is? I got a little idea. Okay. Lou Pinella? Wow, wouldn't that be something?